Yeah, good one. Four, okay. Three, two, one. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have people here in the church's building on, and uh, we're having an indoor service. Also, good morning to those of you who are watching online. This is the service for the Big Trees Community Bible Church, and that's who we are. We're glad to be able to meet together in person or online. And uh, I'd like to begin by reading from Psalm 100, and it goes like this. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness is endures to all generations. Shall we pray together? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come with joy in our hearts. Thank you that you are here present with us. And so we come before you and we desire to come with hearts that sing and perhaps with voices that sing, whether it's singing online or, or singing in person. And we thank you that even though we are restricted from the normal celebration of, of you in worship, uh, we can do it this way. We thank you for that opportunity. We are your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. And so we come. We come with thanksgiving. We come with praise. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your loving kindness, for your faithfulness that is everlasting to all generations. We ask for your blessing upon us this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us, encourage us, strengthen us. We pray for uh, that gracious gift of your presence. And Lord, we pray that from our hearts to your heart, that you would be blessed and pleased and uh, just honored as we worship you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I probably should explain, actually, why I'm here. Pastor Jeff is back in Minnesota. He went to visit his dad and really to say goodbye to his dad. His dad passed away this week. Uh, and Robbie Severson is now in the presence of the Lord in person, face to face with his Savior. And uh, there's rejoicing on that. Point, but uh, there's also grief for Jeff and Malou, and so uh, we will pray for, for them later, but just letting you know why uh, I'm here. I'm Pastor John, for online people that perhaps don't know. Um, so we are going to worship the Lord and sing to him, and uh, let's stand, those of you that are here in person and online, you can stand also. We're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Okay. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in. You came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Back to the beginning. Lord, I lift your name. from heaven. 
sit back down again. Yes. Gets cold in here. The guitar strings kind of get out of tune. The tuning in the guitar may not be faithful, but the Lord is. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And we're going to sing that one a couple times through together, shall we? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Before we sing another song, I'm going to just break for a few announcements. We don't have too many this morning, but just a few. Uh, Wednesday, American Heritage Girls will be here starting at 4 p.m., and they'll be packing the Christmas child boxes to be sent out various places throughout the world. And uh, so they'll be here at 4 uh, and so that's happening. The Lord Teach Us to Pray on Wednesday night will not be happening. Jeff and Malou are still going to be back in Minnesota. That Wednesday actually is the day for the memorial service for Roy, Jeff's dad. So he'll be back there uh, doing that. So, but we do have a memorial service coming next Saturday. It's the 21st of uh, November. At the Sabo's home, we're going to be able to gather and remember with love and fondness, uh, Jack Sabo, um, who's with the Lord. And uh, it's at the Sabo's home, here, uh, not here, in Murphy's, <laughs> is where uh, Sabo's live. So um, that's at 1 p.m. And we're encouraged to bring chairs to sit in for ourselves, as well as finger food. And I don't know if that's shareable or if you just bring your own and eat your own, how all that works with the the COVID-19 thing. But in any case, we're going to gather together and space and be distanced and all of that. And uh, we're going to remember Jack and sing some songs and, uh, and um, have just a time of, of focusing our hearts on heaven and the Lord uh, there with Jack. The only other thing to say is... Um, for the offering, those of you that are watching online can send a check to Post Office Box 527, Arnold, California, 95223. And um, those of you that are here in person, I guess, what, there are baskets somewhere to give? So you can do that. In the entryway, there are baskets in case you'd like to participate and uh, give. And we thank all of you for faithfully supporting the ministry here. All right, I believe that's all that is. We have another song to sing about God's faithfulness. It's the hymn, Great is Your Thy Faithfulness. I believe the people here in the sanctuary have song sheets. So, and I think Kyle's going to have the words up on the, for the online thing. All right, let's sing to the Lord. Would you like to stand, those of you that are here? It's your last golden opportunity <laughs> before the message. Okay, let's sing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no 
shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is You can sit back down again. Again. All right, I'm going to put the guitar down. And that way I'll be able to be free to read all the stuff. Um, hold on a second. <clears throat> All right. Well, in a moment, we're going to open up the scripture. And for those of you that are here in person, you have it on the song sheet. It's on, is it on the back of the page there? Okay. So, or you can use your actual Bible Bible. All right. Before we do that, though, we want to uh, come to the Lord in prayer and speak to him and uh, then we'll open up the word. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we have been singing about your faithfulness, how great it is. We don't even really understand how great your faithfulness is. Um, but we thank you that you have revealed yourself in the creation. You've revealed yourself by your spirit. You've revealed yourself through the, the scriptures. And we have the whole Bible that testifies to your faithfulness, your dependability, your trustworthiness. And so we, we thank you for that. And so we honor you with our, with our prayers this morning, Lord. As, as I'm speaking and, and the rest of us are saying amen in our hearts to that which we're, we're asking for and that which we're proclaiming. Father, we come with some 
prayer requests, we think of Jeff and Malou. And we know, Lord, there's that emotional roller coaster that happens there and thoughts that go through the mind and all of the rest of it. That on one hand, there's joy that Roy is with you face to face. And yet there's grief because he's not on earth any longer. And uh, we pray for your Holy Spirit to comfort and be helping and strengthening Jeff and Malou, our beloved pastor and wife. How we thank you for them. We ask for your, your mercy, your grace, your strength. Thank you that you, can, you are all that you are in them for this particular time. And so we, we pray for your richest blessing on both of them and on Dolores, Jeff's mom, and the rest of the family as well, Lord. Lord, we pray, thanking you, you brought Sharon Strazo through her knee surgery. We pray for full recovery for her, uh, for your healing to work in her body. Thank you that she's uh, up and walking and, and ho she's home. And uh, we just thank you for your, your blessing for her and her husband Richard as well. We pray for Terry Espeezy, Father, going through tests this coming week. And uh, we just ask that you will uh, equip the medical people to discover what's going on within her and to provide the help that she needs medically. We thank you that you are the healer. You are the one that she can put her confidence in. We pray for peace of mind and peace of heart for Terry, Father. We pray that she will put her full trust in you. Lord, we think of this boy who was injured at CFLC, and we thank you he's improving somewhat. Uh, we just pray for your grace to be poured out upon him and his family and on the school there uh, for this accident that happened. Um, we thank you even in the midst of all of this, you are with them. And we pray that they would sense your presence and place their trust and their confidence in you. We pray for Steve Richards, Father, having had um, surgery on his foot. And we pray now for the healing. We thank you for the healing that's already taken place by your grace. And we pray you continue to give the doctors wisdom as uh, he continues to heal. Um, and we thank you that uh, he and Beth and Jocelyn are in your care and that they're trusting in you. Uh, again, we we just thank you, Lord, that you care about each of these things. Even though you made the universe and all of the worlds and everything, um, you care about us individually. You've told us to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. And so we, we pray for Steve and Beth and, and Joss. Lord, we pray for just all the ongoing medical uh, needs in our, in our church community and others that perhaps aren't part of the the church as yet, but we know them, their friends or relatives or people that are in various physical needs. We ask for your help, your healing for, for each of them and for the needs of their spirit and their soul as well, Lord. We pray that you'll meet each one. We think of Oscar with his back issues. We pray that you will bring comfort and help for him. Um, and we ask that uh, you'll provide him with work that he needs. And Lord, we also would just beseech you on behalf of our country. We know, Lord, there's just a, a lot of things that are up in the air, a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, lots of outcomes, lots of different things that are going to be happening, changes coming, all kinds of things. Thank you, Father, that you're aware of the government of each nation, and we would desire to submit all of this to your care and put our trust in you. And Lord, I pray now as we open up your word, we thank you that you promised that your word is sharp, alive, powerful, effective, that as it goes out, it never returns without doing its work according to your purpose. And so we pray that you will speak through me as I give it out. Uh, may the Holy Spirit do the work in each of our lives. Lord, take the word and make it understandable and make it clear. Show us how to apply it in our individual lives, Father, and as our, uh, in our life as a corporate community, as a church. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank the Lord. 
Psalm 46 is where we are going to be this morning. And this psalm deals with a celebration, actually, for the Jewish people. There's psalm 46, 47, and 48 are a three-part three sort of celebration for a victory that God accomplished in the nation of Israel. And we're going to see how some of this applies in our situation as well. And there's some fascinating stuff here that we're going to um, go into. But it deals with what to do when life is chaotic, what to do when we need protection, what to do when we need help, what to do when you find yourself in a tight place. I don't know if you've ever been stuck anywhere. Um, I remember almost getting stuck in a revolving door. Remember what revolving doors were? Some of you that are old enough to remember. We don't, do we have any revolving doors anymore? Not around here. But I was nine years old, and we'd come out to California from New York State, and there was this opening door, and my mom said, well, okay, let's go through the door. I went through the door, but it kept going around. And I, wow, she said, just, just keep going. Go with the door. Go with the door. There you go. There you go. And then I came out on the other side. I was so glad to get out of that. Can't imagine what would happen if your shoe came untied and you bowed down to try to tie your shoe and that thing kept going around. <laughs> you don't go there. Bad news. What happens when you get into a tight place, a place where it doesn't seem like there's any answer, any way out, any way to deal with difficulties? Well, Israel found itself in that place, and our passage will reveal that. Let's look at the first three verses, verses 1 through 3, Psalm 46. It says, by the way, that it's for the director of music. And it was written by the sons of Korah. According to Alamoth, Alamoth actually is a word that means it's for the woman song leader to lead the song. And it's a song. Let's see what it says. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore... We will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And then there's this little word, Selah. We'll talk about that in a minute. What in the world is going on here? Verse 1, it begins by describing who God is. And whenever you're in a tight place, that's the best place to begin. Whenever life seems like there's no way out, there's just too much pressure, too much going on, too much medical stuff going on, too much in your, your heart, your mind, too much in circumstantial situations, God is described. See the words here? says he's our refuge. It means God is the first one to go to for shelter, for safety, and for protection. When life gets pressury, God is our refuge and our shelter. It says he's also our strength. That means in the midst of the tight place you're in, in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of whatever it is, God is our power, our boldness, our confidence our capacity to persevere. It doesn't say, I am my own strength. I am my own refuge. I am my own perseverer. It says God is the one who is the one we turn to. And then it says he's an ever-present person. God is personal. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This means all three persons of God are ever present in the life of the believer. He's right there. He lives inside. If you're a Christian, the Spirit of God lives in your spirit, never to be removed. He will abide with you forever, Jesus told the disciples. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus uh, says through the apostle in uh, Hebrews. So God is ever present and he's our help. It's another word. He's our help. And it says he's our help in trouble. Well, the Israelites were in trouble, and I'll describe the situation in a minute for you. Um, in a troubled place, 
the Lord is our helper. The literal word here in the Hebrew, it means in a tight place, a hard place, a hard pressure place. Look at verse 2, however, because there's a conclusion which is drawn right at the beginning. The conclusion, what is it? We will not fear. The admonition in Scripture never is, well, just buck up. Come on. Don't be scared. Just suck it up. It's always God is our refuge. God is our strength, our power, our capacity. God is ever-present. He's right there. God is our help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I love that. I don't know how many times in the Bible it says it, fear not, fear not, fear not. I can't just choose to not be afraid. I need to have something to replace fear with. What do you replace fear with? Faith, confidence. Your faith is only as good as the person in whom you place it. It's not so much we need more faith. We need to have more understanding of who it is we're trusting, who it is we're placing our faith in. And that's why the verse says, God is all of these things to us, our refuge and strength and our power, our very present help in trouble. And so he says, therefore, we won't be afraid. And then there is this description of all kinds of calamity. You notice in, in verse 3, and these are um, what we would call natural disasters or natural uh, problems. But he's using poetic language to describe a, an actual situation that the tribe of Judah and Benjamin were going through. But look at the description. He says, here's why we're in a tight place. This is why we're in trouble. This is why we need to turn to the Lord. The earth is giving way. The mountains are falling into the heart of the sea. And the waters are roaring and foaming. And the mountains are quaking and with the surging of, of all of that. It's poetic language. What's going on? This is pretty fascinating stuff, actually. The year is 701 B.C. Hezekiah is king of Judah. The ten tribes of Israel in the north have already been captured by the Assyrians. Judah and Benjamin are still in the land, and the city of Jerusalem is threatened. The uh, Assyrians are under King Sennacherib. There's a name. I like that name, Sennacherib. His major communicator with the Israelites from Assyria was named Rapshaka. That's a great name, too. I like the sound of some of these names. Um, the Assyrians are approaching the city of Jerusalem. But it's taking a long time because as they approach the city of Jerusalem, they're conquering other cities around Jerusalem. They're conquering other nations around Jerusalem. They're extremely cruel people. It's the nation that Nineveh was part of. Remember when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and told them to repent and stuff, and they did? Um, this is before that. So the Assyrians are noted for being horribly cruel. I won't go into the description of it, but it, it's awful. Horribly, horribly cruel. And in the book of 2 Kings, 18 and 19, and also Isaiah 36 and following, um, we find the account of this whole thing. As the Assyrians are getting closer, they send an envoy to Jerusalem and says, you know, hey, surrender to us and we'll take you to our land and we'll give you peace and we'll give you good food and we'll give you everything you need. Why go through a battle? And... Uh, Israel says no, or Judah says no, under King Hezekiah. So the army is marching down the mountains and around the area, getting closer and closer to the city. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, says, what do we do? What do we do? Well, what he did was he went into the temple and he prayed. He said, Lord, here's this army. They're threatening us. They are telling us, your God is not going to help you. 
All the gods of the other cities that we've captured around the land haven't helped any of them. Why do you think your God's going to help you? Your God's nothing. Just surrender, give up, you know, stop all this. And so Hezekiah lays this out before the Lord and says, this is what they're saying about you. And so we come before you and ask for mercy. We ask for help. We ask for your protection. And God said, I promise you this, not one arrow will come into your city. I will see you through. I will take care of the situation for you. Meanwhile, the army is getting closer and closer and closer and closer. There's something else they did. Outside the city of Jerusalem on the east of the wall is a thing called the Kaihon Springs. And that's where they got their water. Fresh, wonderful, bubbly, clear water. And as the Assyrians approached, King Hezekiah thought, is there some way we can cut off water to them because they're outside the city wall and they're going to have all kinds of water and we're going to be cut off. We're not going to get any water. What can we do? Let's dig a tunnel from the Kaihon Springs through to the other side of the wall into the city and create a pool of water which we can use. And so they did. Two groups of people, one on the outside, one on the inside, started digging a tunnel down to bedrock. This is quite an amazing miracle, actually, that God allowed this to happen. And they dug a tunnel which is about 1,500 feet from the source of water into the city of Jerusalem. And the water flowed from the spring through the tunnel into the city, and the, the people inside the city had all the fresh, wonderful water they could drink. And then they covered up the spring on the outside so the Assyrians couldn't get any water. Whoa. So there are two things that go on here. Hezekiah prays, and God promises... And then they actually do something in order to provide water for themselves. So you've got these two things going on. They're doing what they can do, and they're turning to the God who can do what only he can do. It's a fabulous, glorious, wonderful thing. Verse 4 of our psalm, well, I forgot about one thing. The little selah word at the end of verse 3, it means stop, think about it, pause, meditate on the fact that... Uh, the Lord is your helper, your refuge, your strength, your protector, your God, the one who promised. And so uh, that's, that's the little pause and meditate and think about it. And so we do. We think about our life when we're in tight places, when we're in difficult situations. We pause. We think about it. It seems like the mountains are shaking. It seems like all the things that we've put our confidence in over a long period of time are beginning to crumble. We've got the virus going on. We've got all kinds of things going on. Where do you go? First place, God, our refuge, our strength, our help, our power, everything else. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. Now, God's not asking us to dig a tunnel from outside the wall to inside the wall or anything else. But the principle is true. We can do what we can do. And then we leave the rest to God. We'll talk more about that when we get to the end. Verse 4 and 5. And now that you know the story, there's kind of a double meaning here beginning in, uh, in verse 4. And again, you can, you can think of the, the songwriters actually thinking about the river that came through the tunnel. But they're, they're going way past that. Do you notice here? He says, well, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So the writer of the song is saying, yeah, we, we, we dug the tunnel. The water came through. We had plenty of water. It was all good. But you know, there's something more crucial than that. There's a lesson. There is a river that makes the people of the city of, gla of God glad. It's the holy place of the Most High. It's where he lives. He says, God is within the midst of her. She will not fall. 
God will help her at break of day. God will help her at break of day. So there's a beautiful poetic thing going on here because they're taking the physical river that was created through the tunnel and ended up at the pool of Siloam, where actually Jesus healed uh, someone in the New Testament there. So it's still there. By the way, if you ever go to Israel, you can, you can walk through uh, Hezekiah's tunnel. You get a little wet, but you can walk through it. Uh, it's still there. This is 701 BC, all the way to where we are here. It's tunnel's still there. I like that. It's a physical, visible r- reminder. But he says, in the midst of the tight place, and in the midst of the place where we go to prayer and we ask for God's help and God gives us promises, then there is this flow from God to us of refreshment, of help, of strength. It comes directly from the Most High, directly from the holy place. That's because God is there. And so we won't fall. He says he will help you at break of day, or I think King James says he will help you right early, right early. And that's what it's talking about. Jesus referred to the same thing in John 7. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And John goes on to tell us, he spoke this about the Holy Spirit who would be given to the church as it began, after Jesus was glorified. So even Jesus refers to this. This thing goes all throughout the Bible. In the book of Genesis, the river of life is there. By the time you get to the end of the Bible, in the book of the Revelation, the river of life is there. So there's a lot of depth in this thing. But it's interesting to me how the songwriter is looking at the literal physical river that they, they had going through the tunnel and then saying, let's go way beyond this to consider the resources. So in the first part of the psalm, verses 1 through 3, we've got the Lord being our refuge and our strength and all the rest of that. And then 4 and 5, God is present with us. He is the river of life in spite of all of the difficulties that are going on. God is our our strength, the most high God, the helper who, who helps early. Well, what happened in the nation of Israel? It probably would be a good way to, to kind of put this together to uh, tell you how it came out. Because we left the Assyrians marching toward the city. They surrounded the city. One of their communicators came up to the city wall and begin to mock God and say, he's not going to help you any. We're going to destroy you people. This is kind of after they, you know, dug the tunnel and the river was flowing and the Assyrians, you know, weren't aware of all of that so much. And so at night, one day, the Israelites, the people in the city, go to sleep in disaster strikes the Assyrians. It says, an angel of the Lord came upon the Assyrians and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were dead in the morning. The Israelites woke up. They listened. They didn't hear any sound from outside the wall. Are they gone? Where did they go? What happened? Well, somebody got on top of the wall, I guess, or whatever, peeked over and said, like they're dead, man. (laughs) (laughs) They're gone out. You say, well, that's pretty severe. No, it's not. The judgment of God was falling upon this nation because of their cruelty, because of their horribleness. Later on, he would send Jonah to Nineveh to say to them, you've got 40 days, and if you don't repent, (laughs) curtains. Here, this is this one situation, but 185,000 soldiers. You talk about being in a tight place. How'd you like to be besieged by 185,000 Assyrian soldiers? No wonder Hezekiah went into the temple. No wonder he prayed. And no wonder God said, not one arrow is going to come into your city through the Assyrians. And (laughs) the king was, the king Sennacherib was still around and some envoy came to them after this death of the soldiers saying, "Uh, there's another nation attacking us. We need to get out of here. So the king leaves. He goes back home. And later on, he dies. Did God keep his promise? 
Was God their refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble? Though the mountains were shaking and the waters were foaming and all of these other awful things were happening, poetically speaking, though the Assyrians were, were uh, besieging them and all of that, did God get the victory? You betcha. God kept his promise. God keeps his promises to us, too. You notice how this works, because God didn't stop the Assyrians from coming. He didn't stop the pressure. He didn't stop the tight place. He allowed all of that because Israel needed to be reminded once again that you don't get help from the false gods. You don't get help from the high places where the false gods are worshipped. You don't get help from going to Egypt. That was one of the things that they said. The Assyrians said, what are you going to do? Look to Egypt for help? You're not going to get any help from Egypt. And they were right on that score. You go to God, and he's the one who helps. In the midst of the tight place. Well, let's look at verses 6 through 9, because the thought here is continued on in terms of the pressure. It says, nations are in an uproar, kingdoms are falling. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. I think this is what it's telling us is this kind of thing is going to keep on happening throughout history. Since Adam and Eve committed their first sin, nations have been in an uproar, kingdoms have risen and fallen, People lift up their voice. It seems like the earth is melting. If you go all the way back through the history from the very beginning, all the way to the time when Jesus comes to bring peace on earth, nations are going to rise. Nations are going to fall. Nations are going to be in uproar. Nations are going to be warring one against another. This is not strange. It's what happens. Century after century after century. You say, well, how is that comforting? Well, it's because that reminds us that the kinds of things that we see in our world today aren't different from the kinds of things that were happening in 701 B.C. or any other era that you want to name. Nations rise, nations fall, nations fight. One wins, one loses. They have their civilization for a time. And you can think of all of the empires that have existed down through the ages, for those of us that know anything about all the different ones, they come and they go. They come and they go. But God is the same. God is the same. Verse 7 reminds us of that again. It's this poetic form here where you go from the pressure to the, to the God that we worship. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A mighty fortress is our God. When you get in a tight place, grab your hymn book. Sing that thing. Yeah, there's all kinds of things God has given us to remind us. And then in verses 8 and 9, oh boy, this is good news. God says in verses 8 and 9, you know what? There's coming a day when all of this is going to stop. There's whole bunches of hope here. Verse 8. Come and see the works of the Lord. In other words, he's saying, heads up. Instead of looking at the nations rising and falling, instead of looking at the chaos, instead of looking at all the stuff, let's look at what God does. Let's look at the desolations that he has brought on the earth. In other words, the Lord's involved in this whole process we don't really understand how it works, but the Lord is involved in this rising and falling, this coming and going and all of that stuff. But ultimately, there's going to be a finish to the whole thing. Look at verse 9. Oh, boy. I love this news. You can clap your hands. You can jump up and down and say, all right. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth, which means he makes wars cease forever. Isn't that good news? No more defense secretary. No more diplomatic stuff. No more armies, navies, marines, air force, coast guard, all of it. 
It's going to come a day we won't need that anymore. God makes the wars to cease. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. Now, of course, again, this is 701 BC. The, song, the songwriters are writing. They're talking about people wearing armor and they've got bows and spears and stuff. Um, we have other kinds of weapons and all of that sort of thing, but God's going to break them all. Isaiah talks about turning our swords into plowshares. There's going to come a day when we won't have any more weapons anymore. He burns the shields in the fire. So he destroys them. In other words, there's coming a day when Jesus comes back, when we will have peace on earth and goodwill to men. We really will. We don't need to panic. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to fall apart. We don't need to be constantly agitated and irritated. What we need to do is turn to God first, remember who he is, what he will do, what he has promised, even though the place is still tight and the pressure is still there. We need to remember the river of life that flows from the very Spirit of God into our spirit. And we need to remember that mankind is not going to bring peace on this earth, no matter how many accords that you sign, no matter how many treaties that you sign, no matter what kind of agreements there are. Has there ever been an agreement that man has made with man that hasn't been broken by man? No. <laughs> we don't keep our treaties. We just don't. God always keeps his agreements. <laughs> Let God be true and every man a liar. That's another piece out of Romans chapter 3. But the idea is God's the one that's true. We don't put our confidence in, in, in ourselves. But isn't it easy to do that? And then when it falls apart, we can't figure it out. God says, you had your trust in the wrong place. Verse 10, and this is, this is kind of the best place to end in the world. What do we do about all of this? In our current life, in our current situation, whatever it is, well, we're to do something and we're to know something. You notice in, in verse 10? My goodness, this is good. It says, be still. The literal Hebrew word means put your hands to your sides. Just relax. Stop striving. Stop struggling and being agitated and irritated with it all. Be still. I had a teacher the first year I was at the School for the Blind used to say that to me all the time because I always had music in my soul, right? And I'd be sitting there going... Even at the age of six, seven, eight years old, he used to go, John, be still. Be still. I go, oh yeah, okay. And I'd sit there. It was so hard not to sing. I'd sing. Hot diggity, dog diggity, boom, what you do to me? It's so. John, be still. That's, that's what it means. Stop. Just stop. You know what the opposite of this is? It's a little child kicking and screaming and throwing a temper tantrum and objecting and being agitated. And here he says, be still. But there's something added to this. Not only be still, but we need to know something. We need to know something. God says, I am God. The only way that I can be still and be at peace and be calm and stop striving is if I know that he is God. I'm not. No man-made system is God. And you and I aren't God. Aren't you glad? Too much responsibility for anybody. The only way we can be still is to rest in the fact that God is God. And he says, I will be exalted among the nations. 
It's another good promise. He said, there is going to come a day when I will be exalted among the nations. You go, well, it's not happening yet. It'll come. Be still. Stop kicking and screaming. He says, I will be exalted in the earth, all over the earth. In verse 11, it's another affirmation. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then there's that little word, say, la. It means pause, think about it. Let it calm our hearts and our minds to be still and know that he is God. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that helpful? I've turned to this song the last few months quite a few times, and maybe that's one reason why I'm doing this this morning, is just sharing out of the overflow of my own heart uh, to you. Uh, God's in charge. He knows what's going on. We can drink from the river of life and fellowship with him and pray with him and stop trying to control what we can't control. Hezekiah did not put an army together and try to fight Sennacherib and his 185 thou. Um, he didn't send somebody out and try to make negotiative arrangements or any of that. He prayed, they built the tunnel, and then they put their hands to their sides and waited on God. Be still and know that I am God. That's the word for you and me. And I'm going to sing it. So let's grab our guitar. Whoop. Well, there. If Pastor Jeff is watching, you know I always have trouble with my mic. <laughs> we had a couple of instances with that before. All right, so listen to the words of this song because it's very helpful for us, I think. And it reflects a little bit of the psalm that we were, were uh, studying together. Forever I am with you always. You walk not alone but with me. The shepherd am willing, I will give you my peace. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I can calm the greatest storm. Be still and know that I am shepherd am willing to keep you under my care. The valley of death can be frightening. Come unto me, all those who care. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know still and know that I am God. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I 
have prepared a place for you where you can come and be saved be saved be still and know that i am god be still and know that i am god i can calm the greatest storm be still and know that i Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for this song that I just sang, but also for the song that you wrote by the Holy Spirit through the sons of Korah. Thank you that we can turn to this at any time we find ourselves in trouble. And when we turn to the psalm, we're turning to you. Thank you, Lord, that you are our refuge, you're our strength, you're our shelter, you're our very present help in trouble. And so, Father, by faith we say, Lord, we will not fear, even though all of the stuff is going on. We desire to place our, our trust in you, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is the source of the refreshing river of life. Thank you for you being in the midst of us. Thank you for your help that happens early. And even though, Lord, we see kingdoms come and kingdoms go and nations rise and nations fall and all of that, we thank you that you are still the same yesterday, today, and forever, always. And thank you, Lord, that one day it's all going to be made right Justice will reign from heaven. Your kingdom will be eternal. We rejoice in that hope. But Father, as we're living in this world, in this place now, living this life that we're living now here, our desire, Lord, is to be still, to take our hands off and know that you are God that you, who is the God of Jacob, you are our refuge also. The God Almighty is our, is our God we turn to. And so, Lord, we, we pause, we think about that. And, Father, we want to place that whole psalm into the life we're living right now, Lord. In our personal life, our health life, our family life, our working life, or the need for working that we have, Whatever that tight place may be, Father, thank you that you promised to meet our need there if we will only turn to you. And so, Lord, by faith, we do. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right, God bless you, and you're dismissed.